I just found out about uh, 30 seconds ago outside the door. So um, I just assume you knew. Sorry. <laughs> we, are, uh, we are doing the thing, all the things today. Um, I'd like. It's my pleasure to welcome Tammy White of Langen of Her Farm to Western New York. Um, for those of you who haven't acquainted yourself with um, the website, um, Tammy White is a natural dyer, shepherdess, um, and just general force um, in fiber. So she has a farm in Shaftesbury, Vermont, um, where she um, raises heritage and small breed um, animals for fiber, specifically for fiber production. She handles fine art and fiber education um, throughout uh, Vermont and then down into the Eastern Seaboard. She contributes as a writer to a number of magazines and publications that can be found on the website that will be of note to most of the people here today. We're very, very honored to have her here today. In 2022, um, uh, Tammy was a part of a collaborative installation of uh, work that combined um, climate change, economic consciousness, and conservation um, with fiber arts and um, at the Guggenheim Museum in 2022. Um, we are all friends um, in the business, and um, when Jackie asked me to line up a keynote, I couldn't think of a better person to, to bring to this event, especially in light of everything that's happening with climate and conservation concerns. It seemed like the absolute perfect combination of art and academic thought. So, Without further ado, turn this over to Tammy White and um, find a seat and absorb. Thank you. There's, there's an audience survey that I've asked about. If you wouldn't mind just dropping those on the on the pile outside the door on your way out after we did finish, and um, we'll go until about 1:15, and then we'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for the warm welcome to the Arts Council of Wyoming. Was saying that I wish I lived a little bit closer because um, I love how supportive this uh, organization is. I'll speak up. <clears throat> that was a test. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so um, I can project quite well actually. So my name, Tammy White, I'm actually Tamara, and um, I, I go by that formally just because it's a beautiful name, but I don't really respond to it if you call me Tamara so much because. No one ever called me that my whole life. Um, and um, But it's a beautiful name, and you know, my middle child took it as their middle name, which I love. Uh, but on the farm, I'm Farmer Tam. So it's about five hours from the farm to here. I'm in the tri-state area of Vermont. And uh, I have been raising animals there since um, 2000. I, had, I have been living there since 1987 and had children in the 80s, 90s, and then um, when they were old enough to help me, um, we got some sheep to graze the 20 acres that we have, and we started with Shetlands, and I always say that I will end with Shetlands. Um, perfect, perfect starter flock. Um, and so we got them because we wanted to graze the property and have it more sustainably cared for than running a tractor and using fossil fuels, and these were my kids' ideas way back then, so over 30 years ago, or I don't know how long ago that was now, 25 years ago. Um, and and it was a great move. I had a little bit of background in farming. I was in 4-H when I lived in the Berkshires of Massachusetts, and I didn't have any sheep experience, um, but my kids were the ones that were motivated to learn about them and do all the research, and so we were a great little team. I have three kids. Um, and when they left, I had didn't really have an empty nest because I had the flocks that had started from three to now a dozen and more sheep. And um, so instead of downsizing, I had the infrastructure and I had about 12 years of, of working with the flocks, I, I upsized and I turned my our hobby into my livelihood. Um, and I never thought that I could not do that. I only ever thought that, like, I've always been motivated by pureness and goodness and passion and love for the natural world. And so 
it wasn't in my mind that that would not work out, but you would be surprised at how many people have said that they can't believe that I do this for a living. They dream of doing something like this, but this or that. And, and I, I agree, it isn't typical to be a full-time farmer and a full-time fiber farmer. The thing is, um, I think anything we want to do, if we're motivated and, and you know lean on our community, we are usually enabled to do. So it was, um, it was I've, I've learned a few things over the past several years, but um, even when it's really hard, I know I'm doing what I love. And so, you know, the doors aren't closed yet. And I think that the only reason the doors will close is because, you know, if the bottom went out for whatever reason, and that could happen in anything that you're doing. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little background on myself and my career and how I ended up in the position of speaking to you today. Um, I had gotten a call in 2022 in the spring and um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the person who's behind the call and then I'm going to go into detail about the call. So I had been dying naturally for um, almost a dozen years, probably a dozen years or so. And I taught myself mostly and um, learned a lot by doing and every day I learn more. And I know that I always will learn more because when you're working with um, pigment from nature, you can't possibly understand all of the variables on any given day. And because we are human, um, we make mistakes or <laughs> you know, we have happy accidents. So, um, so I do like that about what I do, about how there are still surprises as, as much as I do it. Um, but I never knew that what I do, dyeing my flocks wool naturally, would lead me to these really interesting opportunities. Um, so there's a little lesson in saying yes, and um, which is my habit. <laughs> I got to learn about an artist who has a completely different lifestyle. Her name is Cecilia Vicuña. And so she was born in Santiago, Chile in 1948. So she has about 20 years almost on me. She is a kindred spirit. <laughs> She moved to New York uh, from Chile in 1980 after the violence and a coup, and then she became involved in the dissident movement. She is an artist. She has exhibits all over the world, um, in London, Santiago, uh, Venice, in Washington, D.C. I stumbled upon an exhibit there this spring, which was so delightful. and. Um, and a lot of in New York and in elsewhere around the world. She's best known for her sculptural works. And they're so cool is what I can tell you about them. She, and, and they will appeal to you as much as they appeal to me. There are two in particular. The Picarios art that she does is, uh, it, it involves sort of an ephemeral element. And quipus or quipus. It's spelled Q-U-I-P-U-S. The precarios stands for precarious or fragile. They are made from discarded refuse and found objects of nature, like you know, like seeds and and grasses, tufts of feathers, and they're delicate and they're small. They're on the edge of being nothing but the effect of them is very surprising. There, they, uh, there is an exhibit here in the other room. I can't remember the artist's last name. His first name is Gerald. <coughs> and um, his piece reminds me of one of these precarious pieces. And then the other art that she's known for are her, her kipus that I had told you about. And they are like um, um, giant, when I, when I saw them in person, my impression was that they were like a giant um, dream catcher. But they're these, these hanging tendrils of wool, mostly. And um, they honor the indigenous land with, with rituals and traditional forms. The kipu are devices by Andean peoples 
to keep the records and they would tie the knots on the threads as they were hanging down. And I learned about that when I learned about her. I didn't know about them and I thought, what a beautiful piece of art and what a wonderful way of storytelling. She often incorporates wool into her work and she also is a painter. One piece that stood out to me when I learned about her was her self-portrait, La Vicuña. And it was a stylized portrait and it's embedded with symbolism. It's quite beautiful and striking if you get a chance to see it. On August 30th of 2022, Vicuña performed a living kipu. She took a small audience from the Guggenheim's rotunda floor to the streets of Manhattan, Manhattan before traveling by a giant ferry boat down the East River. It was a collective healing ceremony and I got to be a part of that. And the, the mission of it was to connect ancient memories with our contemporary culture. I received my invitation to work with Cecilia in April of 2022, so that was only two years ago. I was in the barn and knee deep in lambing. Um, <laughs> so let's see, I'm, I'm going to show you a couple of slides and then you know, discuss a little bit more about the call and how it transpired. So that's the barn, that's the early morning when you're you're either coming in or going out during lambing season. Let's go ahead. Um, and mm -hmm. That's me with my flock. And I'm often garbed like that almost any day of the year because I keep weird hours either <laughs> late at night or in the morning and it gets cool. Probably not in the middle of the summer. I keep all kinds of sheep. I have a I have a variety of, of uh, rare breeds and heritage breeds on my farm. You can go ahead to the next one. And those are, that's an example of some of the natural dyeing that I do on our farm's yarns. I grow everything except for certain items like cochineal, which I can't grow. It's a small beetle that's harvested when it's dead off of the paddles of the agave plant. So uh, almost all of the wool, all of the yarn that I sell is very place-based and as well as plant dye because what is on my farm are the animals and the, and the pigment. And then I combine them and put that out into the world. You can go ahead and go on to the next one. So after I got the call, so we'll just sit on this slide for a couple minutes, okay? After I got the call from a woman um, who had an accent, and I have terrible cell service in my in my on my farm, um, I I set to getting my wool prepared in a new way. So the call was this: she had in her thick accent and very poor cell service asked me if I would be part of an exhibit at the Guggenheim with an artist known as Cecilia Vicuña, who liked to make these beautiful kipus using wool. And so all I heard from, oh, like, it made in wool in the colors of menstrual blood. <laughs> and so all I heard from that was Guggenheim and wool and Vicuña and menstrual blood. So, <laughs> The Vicuñas are these gorgeous small camelids, and I, I've i been a Vicuña fan for many years. Never want to own them because I believe they're too precious, and I, 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 I don't want to own anything that precious, but the fiber is the finest, and it's amazing. Many of you know that. So that piqued my interest. What? There's a Vicuña at the Guggenheim? <laughs> and then the Guggenheim, because they're nothing like hearing the Guggenheim on the other end of the phone, but I didn't know where it was. Um, and so the, I, I was able to patch the conversation, which was that this artist from Chile needed this naturally dyed wool to be able to cascade 54 feet from the rotunda of the Guggenheim. It needed to be dyed in the colors reflecting menstrual bloods and bodily fluids. Well, 
coming from the barn, there is that kind of stuff all over the place during <laughs> lambing season. So I had the visual. I was like, well, I know what I'm going to use. So I shear my animals twice a year. I have different breeds, and some of them require shearing twice a year. There's always discarded wool, the belly wool, I call it, the bits that I don't make into yarn. And I collect them and I save them, not because I'm a hoarder, but because I'm practical. I make sure to tell people that. <laughs> and so, so I had all this wool, and um, I've been keeping for years. This is 2022, and I told you I started keeping sheep, you know, back in 2000. I think that's when we first had our sheep. That's a lot of belly wool. I knew exactly what wool I would use for those 54-foot swaths that would be tumbling down from the top of the rotunda. I used all of that belly wool, and I had it processed into felt. And then we can go to the next step. Um, I had to make 10 of them to contribute to this um, beautiful display. I didn't know how I was going to prepare that amount of wool. I made it up as I went along, even though I took the call. Sure, I can do that. <laughs> I do that all the time, <laughs> but not really winking. So I filled up these giant um, barrels with my mortared solutions, as you can see, and this is my backyard, and um, I was able to submerge the three and a half foot wide, um, a 54 foot long felt swath into them. You can go to the next slide. And then I had to make up my colors, and I knew that if I was going to get these bodily fluid colors, I was going to have to go deep into my matter roots and black walnuts and then tweak them with modifiers to get them to be brighter or darker or a cross between. So on the right you can see that's a walnut vat and um, I save black walnuts that people send to me or drop off or whatnot and I have tons of them and they're so simple and I just soak them year round so I had a ready made giant supply of black walnut. It's a very strong natural dye. It, it sort of self mordants and tannins itself. So I knew it would be a good a good dye stuff. And then the, the matter tub was a lot of matter root. And um, so um, that was a little bit more ambitious for me to make that much matter root dye. But then I started with that, and as you saw, the wool that I had was some of it was colored wool and some of it was white. So I knew if I wanted my reds to pop, if I needed some bright reds or whatnot, I was going to be submerging my white felt into those reds. And that um, if I needed some, some something in between, a muddier color, that I was going to maybe use the brown felt in the red. And if I needed just to have something really dark, I was just going to go with the brown into the walnut. And you can next go to the next slide. Um, and so then I started pulling the fiber out, and I was I was happy with the colors. I thought that they were pretty good bodily fluid colors. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to do a lot of work because some of them got splotchy wherever there was an iron component, like in my um, one of my walnut kettles was in an iron kettle, and it would leave it left a bit of staining from the iron. So I would. Uh, go to the next slide, I would work on them like individually and paint them. And I'm pretty pleased with how my reds came out and I can pop those colors with modifiers too just to get them brighter than what might normally you know show up on some of my fiber. I also use like the very whitest rolls to get the brightest reds. Um, I don't have a very glamorous studio, as you can see. It's beautiful and awesome, but the, my studio is the backyard, and so most of the year it's pretty muddy or cold or whatnot. Um, but it's the best way I know how. And the next slide. So now I've finally gotten them all to the colors that I want, and I need to dry them because they're giant, heavy, wet, you know, fit, felt rolls and it's getting closer to me having to ship them to the Guggenheim. Um, next. And I think, yeah, there's Nessie, my helper. Um, always with the stick, so thought it was great fun to be rolling it out and dropping her stick as we went. Um, 
So I was really pleased with these colors. And I used iron also to help stain some of it, just to make it less flat looking. And it was really, it, it was much of it was just intuitive. And I, I had a lot of experience dyeing, and I don't think I could have come up with such pleasing results if I hadn't. Um, but it also is something people have been doing for years. Natural dyeing is not new. So um, I did not invent anything at all. Next slide. Mm -hmm. These are some of the pieces. That's um, six pieces out of ten that they wanted. And they didn't love it that there were some light patches. So when I had rolled it up, there was some unevenness to the dyeing. And I said I would work on it. And I did work on it. I did like some painting on it with the dyes, which wasn't like the ideal way to apply it. But in the end, it, was, it gave it like a less of a symmetrical look because the artist Cecilia did not like that symmetry. Mm -hmm. And I appreciated that. But um, in the next slide, let's see, I think we're now getting closer to piling it all up. Mm -hmm. And then the next slide, <laughs> so there was, um, the Guggenheim was very concerned about the greenness of this project. And I was obviously very concerned. I had never shipped my wool off. And so it was a little disturbing for me to do that. Now I'm actually doing more shipping with different mills. But back then I, I hadn't in 2022. So um, I'm only a three hour drive from New York City, but it didn't make sense for me to take an entire day to go off the farm to deliver it and, you know, burn up the fossil fuels from my car versus packing it and shipping it. And in the end, the Guggenheim was paying for it. So, <laughs> so I went with it, I shipped it, and then the next slide, and then I met it down there. Mm -hmm. So it's my first time. By then I figured out where the Guggenheim was, it was in New York. And um, they invited me to be part of the performance of this installation. So it was a culmination of, of the work that um, Cecilia had done. And so I got to meet Cecilia. And when I was there, I, I, um, I sort of learned the surprise of it all. And this is something that I'm still, I'll be reconciling for the rest of my life. The reason that she needed these pieces to be naturally dyed was because there was going to be a performance aspect where we all would walk the, the beautiful wool up into the top of the rotunda and then it would come spilling out. And then we would parade it down the streets to the East River and then we would board a ferry and bring it out to sea. Um, and that was a lot of work to throw off the edge of a boat. <laughs> <laughs> but it has deeper meaning, and it's a very beautiful uh, story. It's just something I have to be upfront about how I'm still not sure how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. You can go to the next slide. I think I have a video coming up here. Yeah, and we can click on that. And then the next slide. And the reason why it was important for me to be there was because there was other dyed felt used as well for the display. But only the natural dyed felt was paraded and then turned out to the ocean because it would degrade, it was biodegradable. And so I had to identify all of my sheep's wool, which was easy because it's quite different from the acid dyed wool. Um, and I didn't know I was going to be in a position of being useful, and I loved that. And let, so it was a really exciting and interesting thing to be a part of. On the next slide. So this one might be a longer slide. Might not want to load. We'll give it a second. We'll just go past it. It's going to take too long, and I can just describe what we did. So now. Um, we're out to sea. The slide just in front of it, and, and we don't, if it doesn't start, oh it is. It took a very long time when we cast it out because 
will float. Mm -hmm. And so there were a band, as you can see, of people at the back end of the boat that were holding it by a tail and waiting for it to unfurl. But the boat had sort of just was idling in that, in that at that moment. And there was no current to pull the wool. And you know, it just sat on top of there. And everyone was chanting per <laughs> Cecilia's directive and holding hands tightly. You can see how everyone's holding hands so tightly as part of the ritual. And then that's Cecilia to the right with the gray ponytail. She's over to the farthest right of our, <coughs> our screen here. Um, and I was above taking this video and I was having a hard time like being reverent because that was, it was a very reverent moment because I was like, oh shucks, nobody told me it was supposed to go out to sea. And so it's just gonna float because we all know how long it takes for wool to absorb water. But eventually that giant freighter went past us really closely and then caused a great current and swirl to pull it down. And then that's when we turned around and we headed back into the city and it, the lights were all sparkling and it was quite striking. Um, but we can go to the next, next slide. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure, there's no audio, like this was a, a you know local news that did a, a clip. And so I, I'm sharing that because it, it's a sweet compilation. Mm -hmm. The babies. Um, that's my iron petal I was talking about. Those are Coryopsis flowers, which I added to the matter to make a lot of, to give it some depth, sort of nudges it into like a pumpkin -y, warmer color. Um, I guess it's kind of fun to watch this, and then this is when we were in the Guggenheim. Are amaranthus flowers, which give a really beautiful pink color, deep fuchsia. And there we are, all standing with our rolls before we had to then parade them up into the top of the rotunda. Many of the people that were part of this performance were actors and actresses. So they got a little bit of money for helping. And you see, like, the strings of, there were all different versions of wool. I love that this artist uses wool as, as part of her work. And there it is floating and not submerging for a while. <laughs> um, and I don't know if I have one more slide or not. No. Okay, we can turn the lights on and then I can wrap up. You think of the lights. It was generations of my sheep, yeah. Um, it was, I had a note that I wanted to share and I'm not really sure if I can find it. Um, yeah. There is one note, let me see if I can find it. I think I might have moved it and now I can't recall it. So I will tell you a little bit more about Cecilia. She is the artist, and I'm merely a supplier, a cog in the wheel. And she has no idea that I'm here talking about her work. And I just want, like, I want everyone to know about this small person who's, you know, in her, she's in her late 70s, I guess, um, who <coughs> endeavors to make a difference every day with every piece of art. She doesn't choose a luxurious lifestyle at all. She works very hard to, to stand behind her message and her mission of connecting the past to the future and in hoping that there is a future to connect to and to talking about it today and doing it in such a powerful demonstration so that a person like me or others will go out and share the message. And she couldn't have known that when I was connected to her project that I would want to share at, at large because we didn't know each other, but we got to meet. She was so pleasant and sweet and very soft-spoken, and um, she is a tiny person. 
with a giant personality uh, and tireless and fearless. And she said she wanted to come to my farm someday mm -hmm. because she would like to you know, see the process. Um, and that was meaningful for me. But more meaningful was working alongside somebody else who has had many more challenges in her life than I've had in mine, who stands behind her passion and her work and tries to make a difference. And that is what I try to do every day. And that is why I work the way I work and do, you know, do natural dyeing, even though it takes several times as long as if I didn't do natural dyeing and raise my own animals and make sure that the fleece is properly handled and the animals are humanely treated because I care as passionately as her. And um, one woman that I have always admired, whom you probably also admire, is Jane Goodall. Mm -hmm. And so I always have felt an affinity with her, even as a young child. And I found the perfect quote which was from Jane, which is, you cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. And so I will leave you with that because of our theme of different this year at Fiber Flurry. And thank you very much. Thank you.